Please uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We'll read this uh, in its entirety, uh, but our focus will be on verse 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He, will, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will sh- surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. But the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his, for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, The man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Let's pray and ask God to bless uh, the preaching of his word. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be gathered here. We're grateful, Lord, to be opening your word from Genesis 3. And we pray that together, Lord, our hearts would be focused upon you. And that the words of your servant's mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people say, Amen. Dear people of God, called to be saints, what is the gospel? Have you ever been asked to explain the gospel to someone? As Pastor Inks mentioned, uh, this summer I'm going to be at the convention, and my topic that has been assigned to me is Evangelism 101. 
and I have, I've had plenty of opportunity with high school students to ask them, what is the gospel? And often what I find is when, when you ask them that question, especially in a role play situation, they can panic. Often the case is, is, that, is that when they have that opportunity, they don't know where to start. They've been given so much information in preaching and in catechism and in home instruction. And often just getting out of their mouth what is the essence of the gospel can be very difficult. And so when we ask, what is the gospel? We need to be able to answer. And in many ways, it can be very simply stated as the gospel is the good news of salvation through Christ Jesus to helpless and undeserved sinners. And where is the gospel found in scripture? Now, obviously, we know that the gospel is found in the gospels. John 3.16 comes to mind. Paul, in many of his writings, he, he talks about the gospel. It's the power of salvation for all who believe. And, and that word in the Greek New Testament is euangelion, from which we get our English word evangelist, evangel, and evangelical. And though that word for God, the gospel is not used in the Hebrew language in Genesis chapter 3, the concepts of the gospel are certainly here. But to need good news, you need bad news. And in Genesis 3, we see really bad news, not only for Adam and Eve, but for all of us. But we also see here in this chapter God's good news in response to their sin. We see that God's salvation was given to helpless, undeserved sinners. And so this morning, we consider an important verse in Scripture, a, a very pivotal, pivotal point in God's revelation to us in verse 15. Theologians call this the, the Proto-Evangelion, which is simply meaning in Latin the first gospel. Christian tradition has referred to this particular verse as the first gospel, since it is considered the first announcement of the coming Savior. And so this marvelous verse reveals a great deal of insight and perspective into the entirety of God's redemptive plan for his chosen people. And so it helps us to see the flow of the Bible's grand narrative from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's giving us hope in a fallen world where we struggle against the devil, against the world, and against our own flesh. But it's also giving us a confidence that God, through Christ, has indeed conquered sin and death and hell and Satan. So let's together look at the first gospel proclamation in Genesis 3.15. We'll do so in three main headings, if you're taking notes. The first is the context of this gospel proclamation. The second is the conflict of this gospel proclamation. And then the third is the conquest of the one proclaimed. So first, the context. We've just read the entirety of Genesis 3, which is, of course, the account of Adam and Eve's fall into sin. And before this, the world was without sin. God had created Adam and Eve as sinless human beings, and they only knew joy and happiness and delight as they enjoyed that fellowship with God. And it's kind of difficult for us to actually imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve how wonderful it truly was. And we get a picture of it when we start to long for heaven as believers, right? We start to, to long to be without sin. We long to have intimacy with God, to, to not have the, the barriers and the frustrations that we deal with now. We long for it. And so we get kind of a taste for what it might have been like. But it will be better, of course, in heaven. But you see, Eve was tempted by Satan's smooth speech. And she, she ate from the fruit of that tree that God had forbidden and Adam went along with it also, and, and there our first parents plunged us into sin. Now, children, you know this story very well. This story teaches us how the world became stained with sin, why we have sinful hearts and troubles and difficulties in life. It's why you sometimes struggle to honor your parents and to respect what they say. It's why you possibly fight with your siblings. <clears throat> It's why you have challenges in school. It's why you often are faced with challenges when you deal with peer pressure from 
outside sources, those who are trying to convince you that to go the way of the world is better to go the way of God, and you, and you sense that. It's why all of us are sinful, and it's why all of us struggle with that old man within our hearts. And we know that God did not cause this. Adam and Eve did, and, and we have inherited their sinful nature. Right? This is the context of, of this verse. You see, they were guilty, and we are guilty. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to establish this very, very bad news, if there's going to be any good news. But in our text, God speaks here directly to the serpent, who is the tempter, Satan. And God said to him, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Now, just prior to our text in verse 14, God cursed Satan, saying, he will crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. He's cursed, but he's not destroyed. God pronounces judgment against him, but he was not removed from the earth. And realize, as many of you do, that this is not the first time God has pronounced a judgment against Satan. We know that he was created as a beautiful angel, in heaven. And according to Isaiah 14, pride got the best of him and God cast him out of heaven. And so he's on earth. And in, and in Job, when God comes to him and says, where have you come from? He says, from roaming around the earth and going back and forth in it, right? He, he was cast out of heaven. He was, he was given a judgment. And here God is giving him another one. And you see, Satan, at this point, on earth is attempting to begin to amass for himself a kingdom of people who he will take with him to hell for all eternity. He tried with Adam and Eve. And anybody that is not in Christ is the offspring of Satan, according to our text. In fact, without God's intervention in your life and in mine, each of us would be considered the offspring of Satan. Those who don't know Christ are in his family. You see, because of sin. But praise God that he did intervene. For without that intervention, where would we be? But notice before Satan could claim any victory or dominion over Adam and Eve, he immediately and he decisively came to their cause and to their rescue. He, he turned their hearts away from Satan, away from his lies, away from the guilt and the shame of their sin. He turned their hearts back to himself. He sought them out. He found them in their nakedness, in their shame, in their sinful blame shifting. They tried to hide, but God looked for them. And when he found them, he confronted them, and he demonstrated his grace and his mercy by giving to them clothing made of animal skins. He could have wiped them out of that moment, but he didn't. He shows his patient love for them. You can see what God is doing here, especially in light of the words of Paul in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. God granted them repentance that led them to a knowledge of the truth. Why would he do that? Verse 26 says, so that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Adam and Eve were only taken captive for a moment and God pulled them back. It was God's mercy that freed them from Satan's grip in that moment. He didn't waste any time. Has God rescued you from this trap? Are, are you in Christ? Doing youth ministry for a number of years, I've noticed that many young people are good at faking it but not just the young people, us adults too. We can often fake that we really love God. We can come and go through the motions. We can dress properly. We can have all appearances outwardly that everything's fine, but we're not. And yes, we're, those of us in Christ are going to struggle with sin. Those of us in Christ are going to wrestle, but there are times where we have to ask, Am I saved? Am I truly a child of God? If you are in Christ, the old has gone and the new has, gone, has come. 
But go back to Adam and Eve here. Notice their repentance. It could not mend the damage that they had caused. Sin always has consequences. God is a just God. He must punish sin. And God's judgment on Eve is that she would experience much pain and childbearing. She'd be subject to her husband. God's judgment on Adam is that the ground would be cursed, causing work to be difficult and toilsome. And to both of them, God declared that they would both one day die and become as dust, just like they were created. They were banished from the garden, that place of incredible beauty and blessing. You see, they were, they, were, they were punished. They were disciplined. And so was creation. All creation was put under the curse that they brought into the world by their sin. Their own righteousness could not save them anymore because they had become sinful. Most of us understand this context, but it's in this context where we see the bad news and the good news, the bad news of sin and the good news of God coming to the rescue. But there's more in this verse that is very significant. Notice, secondly, the conflict within this gospel proclamation. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will bruise or he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now the word that we have right here, enmity, this means conflict or, or hatred. It means a long-lasting, long-standing hostility. A clashing of two powerful forces. Theologians call this the antithesis. The antithesis can be defined simply as, as the God-ordained hostility between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The God-ordained hostility. He says, I will put enmity between these two groups, between God's people and Satan's people. He, he draws this clear line of separation between these two kingdoms, and he declares that this conflict, this hostility, will remain between God's people and Satan's followers until the serpent's head is crushed. God has created this. He wants this friction to exist between his people and the world. So you and I are in one kingdom or another. We are either God's children or we are offspring of Satan. And I pray that that is not true of any of you present here, that you are an offspring of Satan. But how does this antithesis actually work? especially for the Christian. What does it actually look like practically in life? Well, before we look at our own lives, let's look at the example in Genesis 4, which Pastor Inks uh, read already this morning, providentially, the account of Cain and Abel. Now, Abel brings God an offering by faith, right? And God accepts it. But God did not accept Cain's offering because he did not offer his offering by faith. And of course, this makes Cain very upset. And God asks him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, notice this. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. This is right here, the antithesis at work in Cain. This is that God-ordained hostility between his kingdom and Satan's kingdom. They're coming together in Cain. And notice how, how John explains this incident between Cain and Abel in 1 John 3.12. He warns, do not be like Cain, who belonged who, to who? The evil one, and murdered his brother. John tells us that Cain was of that wicked one. He was of the kingdom of Satan. So do you sense this antithesis at work in your life, in the world around you, within you. When you know the good that God calls you to do, do you sense that the temptation to sin is right there along with you? Paul did, right, in Romans 7. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin 
at work within me. So where do you see the antithesis at work in your life? Where do you see this clash between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom? Christians often sense this most when they are attempting to share the gospel message with someone. Before the service, uh, we prayed, the council prayed, and one of the prayers that was, was prayed was that we would have the boldness and the courage to proclaim the gospel during the week ahead, that we would be found faithful. And pastor also prayed that. And it's my experience that when we have been given the opportunity to open our mouths and share the good news of Jesus Christ, we don't know what to say. We might get it wrong. They might reject me. You feel this this weight, this pressure. It's uncomfortable. And that sensation is often the antithesis at play, at work. You are stepping into the middle of the force between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, and there it is, and you're there. And it's powerful. It's fearful. But that's the call of every Christian, to have the confidence that comes from this particular text, that God wanted that hostility there in that moment when you are about to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Christians must recognize the presence of this antithesis in our lives. We should expect it. We should plan on it. And as you live in obedience to the Lord, your life will shed the light of Christ in a dark world. Those of the seed of Satan love the darkness and they will hate you for being a reflection of light that comes from Christ. And and Jesus said this in John 3, 20 and 21. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. God created this hostility. He put it there. He designed it to be this way from the moment Adam and Eve sinned. And this is a comfort. Because we are not fighting people, are we? Paul tells us this in Ephesians 6. For he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we need to ask, whose child are we? Whose offspring are we? We need to know for sure. And I pray you do. The truth is, the reality is that you and I are a member of either one or the other. There's no middle ground. But have, how many of you have lived this or witnessed somebody trying to do spiritual splits by keeping one foot in the kingdom and one foot in Satan's kingdom? We'll follow God part of the time, but when I don't think anybody from the church is looking, I'll go do what I want, right? And I'll enjoy um, whatever it is that, that uh, Satan and his descendants are doing, his offspring, right? And so you can just imagine the spiritual splits that go on and the acrobats that that fakers do to try to convince everybody around them that they're good. Everything's fine. Yeah, I grew up in the church. I love the Lord. Don't ever question that. I'm fine. But, But deep down, we know. Deep down, you know if this is how you live, that you are not living according to the offspring that you have been called to be. And if you're a covenant child, you don't really have a choice. You're being raised to love God. You're being raised to follow him. You're being raised to one day make profession of your faith and declare that, that he is your God and you will, you will live for him. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. This type of spiritual straddling gets us into a lot of trouble. And if you're a child of God doing it, well, we all know that if he has truly chosen you, he'll bring you back. He will bring you back, but whatever means necessary. And so... Be aware with with the fact that there is this conflict, that if you're not thinking about it, if you're not sensing it, asking God to reveal it, being open to it, you will find yourself slipping into it when you're not looking, when you're not 
being watchful. But this was created at the beginning. This is nothing new. All through scripture, it's here. So really, there's, there's an epic war waging between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And we find ourselves right in the midst of it. But this conflict will not last forever, for we're assured the conquest of the one proclaimed. The conquest of the one proclaimed. Now, if you notice, the latter part of verse 15 reads, He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, I'm using the NIV translation, which we use at Trinity. And uh, the ESV says bruise and bruise, but really the words um, are crush and strike. We'll get to that in a minute. But we really need to ask, who is the, the he that God is referring to here? He just uses this little pronoun, right? He. Our text does not give us a name, but we are given the promise that someone from the seed of the woman will come to crush the head of the serpent. And of course, through this whole message, I have been explaining to you that this is none other than the promised Messiah, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as revealed in in the New Testament. Now, some liberal scholars have tried to dismiss the idea that this text is actually speaking of the Messiah. And the reason for this is they argue that the immediate context here in Genesis 3 gives no indication that this is what God intended to say. And that the author of Genesis would have not been able to comprehend God's grand redemptive plan. Would you agree here? There are many so-called Reformed Christians that would say, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, after all, it doesn't say Messiah. Uh, it's kind of kind of veiled. Yeah, maybe, maybe this isn't really about Jesus. And, and we don't have to focus so much on the the implications of this particular text because, well, it's not clear. There's a lot of so-called Christians and even Reformed people who who are kind of confused as to whether Genesis 1 through 11 is really true. And here's one particular verse that, um, you know, may or may not be one that we have to worry about if Genesis 1 through 11 is not true. Well, I know for a fact that this congregation does not have that problem uh, due to the fact that your pastor would never allow you to believe such a thing, but there are those who do. And and an answer to this is really simple. A conservative Bible commentator says this, God is the author of scripture, and this prophecy is a direct quotation of his words. God knew what he meant. He meant to communicate that his son, the second Adam, as the ultimate offspring of Eve, would be wounded in his destruction of Satan. But how can we be sure that this passage actually speaks of Jesus without him being mentioned, the Messiah. Well, the key here is in the word offspring in your text. The Apostle Paul tells us that there is actually only one offspring of Abraham, and he says that in Galatians 3.16. And since Abraham is the offspring of Eve, Paul argues that whenever Scripture speaks of offspring, it's referring to only one Offspring, And Paul identifies this as Christ. Also, since Eve, God has promised that from her offspring, a Savior would come. And, and he continued to renew and develop this promise through Abraham, through David, and the like, all throughout redemptive history. But secondly, the promise of a coming Savior in Genesis 3.15 progresses from the conflict between the offspring of these two opponents, Satan and the woman, but it culminates in Revelation when Satan and Jesus have a final conflict. And John records that for us in Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. From a serpent to a dragon, Satan has grown throughout Scripture. But Jesus crushes him in the end. And his victory is promised in our text. And and the fact that it's shown in our text shows that Jesus, or the Messiah, at least from the Old Testament perspective, 
is in a category of power and righteousness well beyond fallen mankind. Here we see already in the early part of Genesis that the coming Messiah will be both a man as a descendant of the woman, but also a more powerful than a, somebody more powerful than a man in order to defeat this fallen angel. And it, the Savior would be fully God and fully man in order to crush Satan's head. And so the, the he here can be none other than the Son of God. Do you see the, the incredible theological truths here packed into this verse? And there's so much more we could be going into. But these facts about Jesus are revealed in Genesis only in seed form. They're tiny, right? They require eyes of faith to look to the rest of Scripture and then to look back and see that God had, re- had planned redemption right from the beginning. Genesis 3.15 is the foretelling of the Son of God, the promised Messiah. So why is this important? Why does this actually matter? Simply this. Just As soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin, God the Father sentences his son to death. Just as soon as mankind had lost all hope, God the Father immediately restored that hope, doing so at the cost of his beloved son. You see the gospel right there. And why would he do this? For God so loved the world that he he gave his one and only son that that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We see the, the heart of the gospel. Do you see how beautiful this is right at the very beginning of scripture? The gospel on full display. Christians love the gospel. We look for it everywhere. And if it's in the beginning, it's throughout scripture. And at every time we open the word of God, we, we can be encouraged by the gospel that we see, the good news that God brings. Why would he do this? To save you from your sins to rescue you from Satan's dominion, to restore you to a right relationship with God and to give you peace because of Christ. Believers, you know, I know that we have a warm, loving Father who's made the way for us to access him through Christ as the atonement for our sin. Unbelievers don't know this tenderness of God. Often, they see God as as someone who's a tyrant, someone who's out to get them because of their sin, someone who would never allow them to approach him. But this isn't the character of God. God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of his truth. 1 Timothy 2.4. He commands those who are hungry and thirsty, for true satisfaction to come to him without money and without price. Isaiah 55, God is gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. Look at how he treated the Israelites. He continued with them. He kept his covenantal promises. And unbelievers, if you're here today, the fact that you are are still here, the fact that, that God is giving you time should encourage you. And Acts 3.19 calls all of us, but especially unbelievers, those who have have not come to faith in Christ, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. But we have one more question to consider in our text. When did Satan strike the heel of Jesus. The most notable strike, of course, was the suffering, the death, and the burial of Christ. And when Christ died, Satan thought that he had won the victory. But it wasn't only in that moment 
Satan had been striking at Jesus since the beginning of time, for he always warred against God, even in eternity past. He warred against God's Son, and when he couldn't take out his wrath against God or Jesus, Satan took it out against God's image bearers, you and me. So when Satan attacks you, or when he attacks me, he is ultimately attacking God. He hates God. His heart is proud. He wants superiority, and all he can do is come after us if God permits him. He takes his revenge upon God's people because he's taking revenge against God. And so, if you experience this antithesis, if if you're dealing with the hostility that goes on within your heart and your life, you rejoice at the promise that we have here in this verse that the power of Christ will crush Satan's head and destroy his power and confound his every scheme. The power of the cross crushed Satan's whole empire, stripped him of his authority and his tyrannical rule over the bodies and the souls of men. All this was done by the incarnate Christ when he suffered, died, buried, and was raised again for us, his children. So do you see? Do you see how Genesis 3.15 truly is? The first gospel proclamation in Scripture. This promise carries through the entire narrative of Scripture, all the way to the end, when Jesus comes again on clouds of glory to judge the living and the dead. So we've considered the context, the conflict, and the conquest found in the gospel proclamation in Genesis 3.15. And though Jesus' work on earth was completed some 2,000 years ago, one day very soon he's coming. He's coming again. And when he does, he will fully and completely destroy Satan. And until that time, you and I will continue, as we are faithful, to experience this antithesis. Don't be afraid. Look to Christ. Christ had it to the fullest, so you don't have to. But part of the cost of following Christ, part of the cost of being a Christian and believing the gospel is that you will suffer along with Christ in a small way, not as much as he did. Nobody could ever withstand the full wrath of God. And so Jesus stands in our place. And he says to us from John 16, 33, and I close with these words. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. 